hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to start my presentation of Friedrich Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, or Friedrich Nietzsche, however you pronounce it. But before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I'm David. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way that will make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. Who knows, they might get a kick out of it, or they might not, but you could try if you want to help me out, do all of those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. And if you found this in podcast form, you'll be able to find it on YouTube, where if you haven't been there already, I sometimes release videos. Or if you found this on YouTube, you'll be able to find it in podcast form pretty much anywhere where you get podcasts where there shouldn't be any ads, which is obviously better. And yeah, don't want to waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's jump into this extremely difficult text. Now, before jumping into it specifically, I just want to say I've covered a few other Nietzsche texts. So I've done The Birth of Tragedy, I've done The Genealogy of Morals or Morality, depending on the translation, plus a couple of other videos that you can go and find. But with that being said, uh, it's not totally necessary to have a background in Nietzsche's work, at least with what I'm going to do here. I'm going to try to fill in as many blanks as I can. But to have the best understanding, The Genealogy of Morality is the text to either read or go listen to what I did on it before this. Now, as Nietzsche was writing this text, humanity was approaching the 20th century. And this was a, obviously going to represent some kind of turn, be it metaphorical or literal, especially with the emerging industrialization of the time. But this turn, this looking towards the 20th century, encouraged Nietzsche to begin to think about the future of philosophy and how he envisioned that future to be, what he wanted it to look like and what he did not want it to look like. And so he takes aim, essentially, at the entire history of philosophy, picking out a few people he certainly likes, while pointing the finger at many that he very much dislikes, and people who represent certain strands of philosophy, or certain possibilities of philosophy that he laments that he dislikes. So like most texts, this book starts with a preface, in which he begins by going after the dogmatists for their naive faith in the existence of truth, or this idea that through reason one can arrive at truth. Now at the end of, at least in the version I have, at the end of The Birth of Tragedy is found the essay uh, Truth and Lies in the Extra Moral Sense, in which Nietzsche begins to lay the groundwork for a certain issue he is confronting with language. And that issue is that language can only go so far in actually conveying truth. Because any truth that is going to be conveyed through language is going to be limited by the fact that language itself is not true. Language is only giving us representations of perhaps ideas or things in the world. And so by that logic, language is going to be limited in what it can actually convey in terms of truth, if it can con um, convey truth at all. So some examples of things kind of avenues of thought that he takes aim at is Platonism and Christianity or Christian dogmatism and their emphasis on things like the pure spirit or the good in itself. Because what really is this thing called the pure spirit? If not just two words slapped together, that is pure and spirit, that convey some meaning, but that meaning is going to be contingent upon the social setting in which it is found. And so there's always a kind of slippage between what language is meant to convey and how it might be, maybe, might be, how it may be understood. So accepting this, accepting this issue when we are confronted with language and the possibility of arriving at truth, he lays the groundwork for this text, which moves into chapter one, Prejudices of Philosophers. Now these camps of philosophy, like the ones just mentioned, like dogmatism, you know, Platonism, Christian uh, theology or Christian philosophy are guided by what he characterizes as a will to truth. So for them, the object of their philosophy is to arrive at some kind of truth, and that truth will then inform how to either worship God, how to organize society, how to make the world more equitable, and so on. And truth is quite seductive for Nietzsche. He says he calls it, he says it has tempted us to many a hazardous enterprise, that is, the famous truthfulness, as he characterizes it, at least in the translation. So a will to truth, just because it has such plays such a dominant role in the history of philosophy through all of these different camps has been taken for granted. It has been assumed to be 
part and parcel of the experience of philosophy. Now, there were people that took aim at that. For instance, Immanuel Kant, who in his first critique, The Critique of Pure Reason, really took aim at the possibility of arriving at truth through pure reason. So, for example, he says, it is impossible with reason alone, you know, to sit in an armchair and to contemplate things, to actually figure out a truth about, say, God, about the nature of humanity, about what he calls things in themselves, about um, anything beyond perception, anything beyond experience. Immanuel Kant says that that is quite impossible for us to do that. Now, in any case, Kant supplants that truth with another truth that Nietzsche is going to take aim at as we go through this text. But throughout the course of philosophy, there has been a, an obsession with truth and arriving at truth. And by virtue of its ubiquity, its presence almost in every one of these streams of thought, it has become um, almost naturalized, as though we have a natural proclivity for truth. But Nietzsche asks, well, why not a natural proclivity for untruth? For example, language for Nietzsche is an untruth. N language can only give us representations of things or ideas that is not in itself a pathway to truth. Yet we rely upon language to supposedly convey these truths, at least the truths that philosophers claim to have arrived at. So as he says, after all, without a recognition of logical fictions, without a comparison of reality with the purely imagined world of the absolute and immutable, without a constant counterfeiting of the world by means of numbers, man could not live. And he really speaks a truth here, <laughs> wink wink, nudge nudge, speaks the truth here about the nature of humanity that it is always going to be confronted with untruths. We mediate our world through, be it through money, through language, through anything almost, any institution that we, uh, we kind of submit to, none of which are natural, none of which are true in themselves, yet they give us meaning in the world and they condition very much the possibility of arriving at this thing called truth, at least in the will to truth in the history of philosophy. So we are not only then guided by will to truth, it seems as though we have a natural proclivity for untruth. Now, where does this will to truth come from? Does it sprout as an antithesis to untruth? Are truth and untruth in a dialectical relationship? Well, he says no, because to say that is to submit these different things to a logical kind of binarism, to a logical point through which, or a logical line of affiliation, through which they can be compared and assessed. But Nietzsche has no time for that. Nietzsche thinks that any such approach, any such dialectical approach, is just reducing these two very different things, this will to truth and this will to untruth. It also ignores the ways in which they fold together and in many ways are one and the same thing while also being radically different. So they are one and the same thing in the sense that both the will to truth as it has been pursued in the history of philosophy and the will to untruth have been occurring at the same time because this will to truth is ultimately only ever a will to untruth. Now at the same time, they are extremely different in that they have been approached very differently and the relationships to them by philosophers with philosophers has been very different. And so they are in that way both very much the same and very much different and cannot be so simply uh, placed in a kind of dialectical conflict that would just subsume them into this very easy to grasp category. But he's being quite generous here because in the history of philosophy, metaphysicians and other philosophers, dogmatists have just sidestepped the issue by saying that the will to truth that we apparently all have is bestowed upon us by God or it emerges from uh, according to Kant, maybe the noumenal world or uh, the world shared with the noumenon. And this is actually a very clever move on the part of metaphysicians and dogmatists, other philosophers who at the course of the history of philosophy, because then this thing called truth can be associated with goodness. Because if it comes to us from God, if it comes to us from some transcendent sphere, it must then be something to strive for. And if it is something to strive for, it must then be considered good. It must be a good thing that we all go after. And this distinction between 
the good, which necessarily implies the evil, has been very operational in justifying the route certain philosophers, certain philosophies have been on so that they can keep pursuing that route toward this thing called truth. But to this, Nietzsche proposes a radical alternative. And this is an alternative that does not set truth as the point of um, interest. Instead, untruth becomes the point of interest. Untruth as a condition of life instead of truth as a condition of life. And he says that the philosopher that pursues this route, looking at untruth as a condition of life, places itself or themselves beyond good and evil. That is, it is to break away from limiting categories or binaries like good and evil that are conditioned by an assumption that truth exists and that truth is good and everything else is bad or evil, I should say. Now, some other philosophers, perhaps physiocrats or maybe looking at German idealism, sought to not so much develop a notion of the good or of truth from some transcendent sphere like God. Instead, they looked at nature and they saw nature and said, oh, there seems to be a harmony here. There seems to be a general uh, gravitation towards equilibrium in nature where everything will just work out perfectly well. So this is a sign that there is some ordering to the world and this ordering must be good because it's happening without human uh, interaction. It'll just happen even without humans. So therefore, we must pursue that same route in order to be good in the eyes of the earth. Now, Nietzsche says this is total hogwash because nature is indifferent. Nature is unjust and nature is unpredictable according to our human standards of what these terms necessarily mean. Not to mention the fact that nature might actually result in its own demise. Now, this is much, uh, this knowledge comes much later than Nietzsche's, uh, Nietzsche's time, but nature is quite self-destructive. There are certain breeds of beetles, for example, that are going to be responsible of taking out entire forests or with the passing of time, with the sun growing uh, and therefore growing in intensity, the sun, which is a necessary condition for nature, will result in just over many millennia, perhaps, will result in polar ice caps melting and the earth eventually all being covered over with water, which can then uh, will slowly but surely bring about the demise of all things nature and real and true, supposedly, on the earth. So he is totally dissatisfied with these approaches as well that don't necessarily appeal to a god, at least not directly, to justify and to put faith in this possible goodness, in this possible truthfulness. And Nietzsche says that there was actually something else going on. These philosophers, that is, the dogmatists, the metaphysicians, the German idealists looking at nature, these philosophers were doing much more, or they were doing something other than pursuing truth. They were pursuing their own truth. They were trying to impose their own will upon God, upon nature, upon the transcendent, upon the noumenon, whatever. Because there is no truth in nature. There is no justice in nature. There is no good in nature. These categories only exist as human concepts, which can then be transported onto nature or onto God or onto the noumenon or whatever. So instead of a will to truth being the guiding factor here, Nietzsche suggests that these philosophers are actually guided by a will to power, a desire to impose their own will, their own interest upon nature. So instead of the entire histor history of philosophy being guided by a pursuit of truth, Nietzsche completely overturns that by saying that rather, it is the demonstration of a desire to command and dominate, to impose an ordering over the world, over others, over God, that seems to uh, exist in all of us. Now, without being aware of this in the entire history of philosophy, these thinkers have effectively limited the themselves. They have put restraints on what philosophy and their own thinking capacities can do because they have narrowly sought an endpoint truth instead of recognizing that this truth doesn't exist. The only truth that exists is their desire to import and to input a truth onto the world. So it is their desire, their will to power, 
that is the commanding uh, the commanding or motivating force here. So these people, these philosophers, are the kinds who would prefer, a, for Nietzsche, they would prefer a handful of certainty to a whole cartload of beautiful possibilities. And these are those people that are immersed in essentially nihilism. They just submit to one viewpoint, and if they don't reach it, then there's there's no meaning. These are the people who would prefer a sure nothing rather than an uncertain something. They want to things to be very clear and cut out and very neat instead of pursuing the unknowable, instead of pursuing the messy, instead of pursuing the possible. So one such figure who I've already mentioned is Immanuel Kant, who sought to explain synthetic judgments a priori. Now, to put that quite simply, Kant said um, it's impossible to know if there's a god or anything like that with pure reason. But how about I apply this thing called reason to the capacity to experience? So let me develop a purely almost uh, fictional or experiential understanding of the world that is a synthetic one. So I know, for example, that um, a table is hard, even though I'm not born with that. And I know that a table here is hard because I've had a relationship, I've experienced the table. So Kant applies to this synthetic knowledge, this knowledge about synthetic reason, or synthetic judgments about the table, for example, he tries to understand that possibility of having these types of judgments, having these experience is uh, a priori, that is through almost pure reason or through reason. And with that, he develops what he calls the categories and he develops various doctrines that explain what faculties exist within the human mind to make such experiences possible. Now, this has been a very short introduction to Kant, I've done a whole number of episodes on it if you wanted to go check that out. But to this, Nietzsche asks, why is belief in such judgments necessary? Why do we need to understand judgment? Why do we need to understand experience in this very clean, clear-cut, almost scientific way? If all judgments are only given to us via language, then all judgments are really only falsities. They are untrue. Now, I don't know how I feel about this whole criticism of Kant, and he said in other places things about Kant that I feel are just incorrect, but in any case, this is what he gives us here. Now, in addition to Kant, there are other philosophers in the entire history of philosophy who just take certain other things for granted as well. They take for granted this idea about a uh, almost complete or totalizing I or self that just experiences the world and, and that's it. You know, we are just sponges that accumulate knowledge, be it through uh, the work of John Locke or, or anything else. Or there's also Schopenhauer's notion of the will, which is not totally important to get into here. But for all of this, Nietzsche just wants to say that none of these things are homogenous. The self, will, the I, none of that is homogenous. These are all multivariate and they are multiplicitous. There is no easy way to understand it. If we do try to understand it in any such clean-cut way, all we are doing is imposing our will to power, our will to control and understand. We are imposing that will on all of these different arenas. And as humans, ultimately, we are comprised of a whole slew of different possibilities here. We are comprised, of course, of body, mind, and emotion, or in other words, uh, sensation, thought, and emotion. All of these different um, possibilities for experience and thought and reason, but each one of those are then broken up into their own uh, subdomains. Now, one of the ways I like to think about this is through the work of Deleuze and Guattari, where the way that they conceptualize desire and the way they conceptualize desiring machines, I think really fits in with how Nietzsche characterizes the will to power, because the will to power doesn't necessarily just reflect the will of a homogenous totalizing being, but the will of the will to power of each one of that being's constituent parts. So the eye is going to have a different will than the ear, for example, or the mouth will have a different will than the hand or the finger or the foot. These all serve very different operations and serve their own uh, end in their own way. Of course, they are all managed and maintained by a singular brain, but it seems a little bit reductive to say that therefore, you know, we can extract or uh, extrapolate a kind of homogenous self that could then be understood. Nietzsche wants to maintain 
a certain ambiguity here, a certain ambivalence about this subject, about this figure in their capacity to exist in the world and how they navigate all of these simultaneous wills to power or will wills to power that exist within them. But the will operates in a certain measure to command and to control, to assume dominion over other things, and this happens over others all the time. Now, the only reason that anyone here is listening to me right now is because our ancestors were more effective at staying alive, which probably involved killing, than others. And, you know, for the 10,000 years that we've been evolving as uh, Homo sapiens, it has been a very violent history. And all throughout the course of history, all Nietzsche is doing is saying, look, people have been fighting to survive, to live, and to live the lives that they want. So all actions imply a certain possibility afforded to that being or constituent part of that being in such a way as to imply that you're capable of doing this because somebody else is not capable of doing it. And there's a kind of, what I will say in a very reductive and simple way, there's a kind of excitement associated, associated with it that speaks to this inherent will to power. Now, this will to power doesn't only work one way, that is, from a subject or from its constituent parts onto others. This will to power also operates against oneself. Now, this isn't necessarily bad in itself. So, for example, if you have a vision in mind about how or you want your life to be, that is going to involve you suppressing certain, maybe desires, certain things that you might otherwise do, and you are therefore imposing some kind of ordering onto yourself to achieve an end that you want. Now, this doesn't present really an issue in itself. However, if the will to power is not acknowledged and there is a will to power exerted against oneself without being fully aware of it, it can manifest itself in ways that are problematic for Nietzsche. So one of the examples that he gives, and this is really drawing from the genealogy of morals, or the genealogy of morality, he considers what he calls the ascetic priests, people who most often live in the church or are uh, hardcore puritanical uh, Christians, essentially, who whip themselves or live a very ascetic life. So ascetic being a life kind of without any pleasure, a life committed only to God, where all you are doing is exerting a will to power against yourself. And this stifles possibility. It stifles your own possibility to become anything new because you are committed solely to this single enterprise. Now, to a lesser extent, as I've already kind of implied, the history of philosophy is filled with people philosophers who have limited themselves by submitting entirely to this will to truth instead of really interrogating their obsession with truth and how it is only a reflection of their obsession for power. So Nietzsche's ideal philosopher, the philosopher he imagines as the philosopher of the, the future or the ubermensch or the superman is somebody who is going to move beyond these rigid traditions, to move beyond a submission to untrue or uh, sort of humanly constructed notion, notions of good and evil in order to break from those uh, rigidities into newness. Now, this is also a person who breaks from the naive reduction of the question of freedom to either determinism or, uh, or freedom or freedom and unfreedom. This new philosopher is not going to be concerned with either of these very reductive camps, this kind of binary opposition that is just totally incapable of capturing the real state of things. And that is because freedom of will ultimately implies a kind of naive transcendence from history, cause and effect, society, chance. Nietzsche doesn't think that that's possible. You know, you're born into a certain setting and you're going to be partly conditioned by that. And it's only by acknowledging it that it is, will be possible to open up your own capacities in a way that will set you among the ranks of the philosophers of the future for Nietzsche. Or there are these arguments about non-freedom, so determinism, where we are all determined in advance, for instance, which essentially assumes a, a silly commitment to cause and effect or to God or to anything like that. So Nietzsche ni neither thinks that we are totally conditioned by any of these things, also by society or by culture. We are not totally conditioned by that, but we are a little bit. So it is about acknowledging that and 
moving beyond it. We are both free and unfree, not totally one or the other, which he finds to be totally dissatisfying to submit to either of those camps. And it totally makes sense that then Nietzsche is credited for setting the stage for what is naively and reductively called post-structuralism, that is considering the ways in which power functions to construct people in certain ways according to certain uh, logistical patterns, to culture, society, all of that. Nietzsche very much set the tone for that, or at least recognizing these forces. But anyways, I digress. So these simplistic avenues, that is freedom or unfreedom, totally forget the fact that humans are guided by a will to power that actually condition and affect something like cause and effect, that affect gods. Humans are able to put an end to gods, which is a pretty fantastic thing. And only by considering this will to power can we break away from these naive traditions, these naive submissions to age-old patterns of thought. And that puts us here into chapter two, the free spirit, beginning to think about this philosopher of the future, this free spirit who's going to break away from these traditions. So there is such a thing as a false truth, or I should say a false freedom. And this comes out from a submission to superficial or artificial notions of truth. So, for example, in the history of philosophy, like with Platonism, you submit to uh, the idea, or maybe let's set up an ideal standard, you submit to an ideal standard, and then that will be the avenue through which you can arrive at freedom. People can arrive at their greatest potential. Nietzsche is totally dissatisfied with this. Because there is a very subtle trick in this position. There's a very subtle way in which, when confronting a certain uh, lack of freedom that occurs before having arrived at this ideal sphere. This implies then that the philosophers serve a kind of guiding role in bringing people almost by the hair to this thing called freedom. One of those things like either you come to freedom or freedom will come to you and it will, you know, do so with, by dropping bombs on you or, or anything like that. And this logic, this impetus is guided by this will to truth, which also assumes a form in part uh, to this uh, will to knowledge, which comes in and almost like a hero to save people from their living plebeian lower lives. And Nietzsche doesn't necessarily discredit that characterization of people, but very much wishes to s sit among them, to see the wonder within what has often been characterized as the lower classes of society, the dirty people. Nietzsche wants to be among them. He doesn't want to be among the aristocrats, the, the priests, the philosophers. Nietzsche wants to explore possibilities out of the mass. Now, as we go on here, he also laments the mass. He sees an, is an issue with the mass because with it comes a kind of herd-like submission to um, what he calls slave morality, which we'll get into in a bit. But he still finds himself having a great deal more trouble with the philosophers trying to tell people what to do because of their naive submission to this thing called truth than with the people who are doing weird things and wacky things. And that is because any truth that these philosophers proclaim to have or to have the key to is only just another co-conspirator with falsity, with untruth. But there's also another issue implied in all this, and that is the way in which philosophy... And here he's poking fun at, or really taking aim at Christian philosophy that makes its truths digestible to everybody. And this is the herd-like mentality that is fostered with Christianity that makes people essentially submit to its logics. Nietzsche says that if there actually existed a truth, this truth would certainly not be communicable to the public at large in the way that Christianity is, or in the way that Platonism is because he says that Christianity is just rebranded Platonism, essentially. Platonism for the masses. To anyone who has actually arrived at a truth, which would undoubtedly be their own truth, what he calls perspectival knowledge, someone who hasn't submitted to the herd or hasn't submitted to the masses, this is a person who's going to most likely exist in isolation. We're going to talk about this more in the second part, the second half of the book. But this is a person who cannot speak to others because they are um, so immersed in their own language that just wouldn't be understood 
by anybody else, their own truth that wouldn't be understood by anybody else. And there's a film that depicts this is quite funny. It's called Little Miss Sunshine, where one character is essentially uh, an up and coming Nietzschean, just a like a teenager. And he doesn't speak for a good portion of the movie. Uh, and one of the characters played by Steve Carell asks him why he doesn't speak. And he points only to a, a portrait or a picture. I think it's a portrait of Nietzsche on his wall. And Steve Carell says, oh, you, you don't speak because, you know, because of Nietzsche. And it's implied, of course, then that this kid is trying to emulate this philosopher living in solitude, not being, uh, s not submitting to the masses, having their own language and their own truth. But anyways, I digress. It's a very funny movie if, you know, you're looking for a funny movie to watch. So this free spirit is a person who would probably live in solitude and isolation as a, almost a show of strength and a daring beyond measure. And this is a person who's going to break from the moral constructs of good and evil. It just insofar as those, those ideas have been formulated in the history of philosophy to maintain certain interests for certain people, which is fine. But this free spirit is going to recognize how that is BS and how their own truth houses a lot more potential for them and realizing their own will. So that will come at the price, or in order to arrive at that point, would demand a shifting in how morality is characterized. So in the history of philosophy before this free spirit, morality was often considered in terms of intent. So if you intended to do something that was considered evil, then you would be criticized for it according to the criterion of morality as it has been established. But in the history of the world, whether or not something is good, which means whether or not something is likely to be reproduced, depends instead on its consequences. So, for example, if the bird of prey eats a hawk, for example, eats a rabbit, what has happened in that instance is the bird of prey has satisfied a craving to eat, which is part of just the harmony of, of, of nature, essentially, which I should reframe as not, not necessarily a harmony, but just satisfying the desire of the eagle to fill its belly with the rabbit. And the eagle loves the rabbit. The eagle doesn't hate the rabbit. In fact, the eagle thinks I could, I could never possibly live without this rabbit. Now, when morality enters the picture, and this whole emphasis on intention kicks in, now suddenly the actions of the hawk can be interrogated. And it could be asked, well, did you intend to inflict harm to the rabbit? Of course, this is a hypothetical, the hawk can't talk. But in any case, this reflects a certain impetus in the moral tradition to understand actions, and by understanding the impetus behind them, the intention, then therefore understanding whether or not they are good or evil. Not in terms of the consequence, which was satisfying the eagles or the hawks uh, craving for food, the need to eat. Because what really is an intention anyways? An intention is only something that can be conveyed through language, which is going to then be filtered through certain dominant codes of understanding, which can then prescribe certain meanings, which can input and impart certain meanings onto that intention to determine then if they are good or evil. But Nietzsche's like, that doesn't make any sense because certainly the hawk is not immoral for eating the, um, the rabbit just because maybe harm was inflicted. It is part of that nature of that hawk to eat the rabbit. It is realizing its own will to power to eat the rabbit, just like the rabbit's own will to power is going to be reflected in its running away from the hawk. Now, obviously, this opens up some problematic conclusions and po problematic possibilities because Nietzsche doesn't allocate very much time to discussing the necessity of cooperation in human history to arrive at a certain point in, uh, uh, to arrive at a certain level of comfort for humans. Now, I'm not talking about complete, like, globalized, uh, global village or community, but just people working together all throughout the course of human history to set up small um, communities that can then thrive, or can survive essentially. Now, if each one of those people just sought their own interest, none of them would have survived. So the group of people is greater than the sum of its parts. 
no one person's interest should overshadow that of the community. Unless that community wants to end. It wants to reach its, to meet its demise. Now, as a unit, though, this community only exists in such a way by imparting its own will to power upon the earth, upon animals, upon other communities, you know, ones that it would find to be threatening or feel threatened by, same with animals and the world. And it has to engage in a kind of will to power, but now it's organized in such a way as uh, around a certain community, forms a kind of whole that where all the people work for their own interests as part of a community. So even in those moments of cooperation, people are still engaging in their own will to power. Now, I think it's important not to bleach what Nietzsche is saying, and I'm pretty sure that that is exactly what he is saying, but it's still quite problematic and raises certain issues about what it means to actually engage with communities. What obligation do people have to one another? Which is a very important question, and it is a question that gets uh, eclipsed by Nietzsche's insistence upon the will to power. So, for instance, he reduces all organic functions to this will to power, like the human organism as a homogenous whole, but also each one of its parts, where the human organism is going to fight off viruses, for example, and it's going to fight off other diseases, or it's going to fight off ailments, and it needs to do that. Each part of the organism, or each part of the human body, does that to engage and to realize its own will to truth, or will to power, I should say. I'm not going to edit that out because it's a funny mess up. So the free spirit, the philosopher of the future is going to be a person that is totally equipped to recognize this truth about humanity, this incessant will to power that guides all interests, that guides all um, all one's inclinations, desire. And they will recognize too that any effort to try and explain away this will to power in favor of a will to truth is just to dupe oneself, to put a mask on, and this philosopher is not trying to take the mask off to arrive at truth. They are going to recognize full well that they are immersed in untruth at all times because they only have their own knowledge. They only have their own truth that ultimately is the result, the product of their own will to power. Now, these people shouldn't be equated, and this is a very unclear point to me. He says that these new philosophers, these new free spirits should not be equated for the types of liberty fought for and he uses the example of, I believe, North America at that time that he was writing this. So in the late, uh, the late 19th century when he was writing this. So he could be referring to any number of people. Either he's referring to um, people vying for more autonomy from external influences, be it the Roman Catholic Church or British influence in the United States. And this is also much after American independence. Or he's referring to black people fighting for um, the end of slavery it's totally unclear, but in any case, it is very, very important to take it with a grain of salt, considering the fact that he follows up this point to say that hardship and um, servitude are essentially necessary to elevate humanity. Hardship is necessary to make people stronger and to make people more prepared to arrive at their own truth, to exert their own will to power. Now, he does qualify this by saying that he's taking aim really at the free thinkers, but again, not entirely sure who he means by this. In any case, it still presents a pretty concerning conclusion, at least this idea that servitude or hardship are necessary to arrive at a certain point of being, because I don't think that the events of uh, slavery in the United States should ever be sought after or necessarily any positives taken out of that, um, just given the horrors of it. And so, of course, we don't let Nietzsche off the hook. We call out Nietzsche for poor, uh, poor judgment, or perhaps I'm just moralizing Nietzsche. In any case, come after me and tell me why I shouldn't moralize Nietzsche or why I should think that slavery is wrong. And that propels us here into chapter three, the religious mood. So here he outlines his disdain for Christianity. And Christianity could have been his focus in the last chapter, not slavery exa exactly. But in, in any case, uh, he, he takes his aim at Christianity as a willing submission to servitude, as a kind of willing, uh, I guess, avenue to live an ascetic life. So these are the people that encourage 
solitude and fasting, sexual abstinence, but not in the way that a free spirit would pursue it. This is just doing the things a free spirit might do without the actual thinking behind it. In this case, that is with Christian servitude or with Christian asceticism, the will to power is sequestered. It is uh, reduced or it is restricted. Whereas with the free spirit, it is encouraged and it is cultivated. And to Christian dogma, he opposes polytheism with what he calls Asiatic uh, traditions or Asiatic religions, as well as Greek religions. And, of, you know, we can think here, of course, India is in Asia, but we can think about the Vedic tradition as well, and so on, where he says that these different religions present different and more, I dare say, opportunities for people to realize their own potential. Because for him, to look at the world through an Asiatic or open eye for him, you know, a, a, through another lens, is a way to view the ideal of the most world approving. Now, one of the results of a world limiting or a world disapproving that we see in like Christianity that Nietzsche takes aim at is that it encourages domination. It encourages missionaries going to parts of the world to try and spread the word of God precisely because these people hate themselves and they have no other uh, avenue to make themselves feel good about themselves than their total and complete submission to the illusion that they are uh, living a virtuous life by submitting other people to these logics like Christianity, to the word of God, etc. So the person that is completely submitted to the will to power wouldn't have these inclinations. They wouldn't be interested in spreading their thought throughout the course of the, the globe because that thought wouldn't be transmissible to anybody else. Somebody totally immersed in the will to power acknowledges that their truth is their own. It is perspectival. It doesn't necessarily have any, um, any resonance with anybody else. And ideally, everybody would have their own truth and wouldn't actually care for it. And so these efforts to dominate, to control, to impart, and to extend one's, one's logics or one's beliefs onto the world is a sign that those are actually the most incorrect beliefs. And religion, especially Christianity, makes suffering appear virtuous. The more you suffer, the better you look in the eyes of God. And we think of the puritanical traditions here in the United States, you know, it's not about, it's about toil and trouble, it's not about enjoyment or anything like that. And this isn't the exertion of a kind of will to power, a will to power by Christianity. It is a will to mediocrity by making one's words accessible to virtually everybody, which can then be used to control people which isn't something Nietzsche celebrates. And it's an important thing to qualify that the will to power is not synonymous with domination. It is not synonymous with global hegemony because that would imply then that the will to power has only ever has only produced a will to mediocrity, something that can be understood by everybody, which is just banality for Nietzsche. There's nothing to celebrate there. Now, the next chapter is a series of short little aphorisms or kind of thoughts by Nietzsche that are only about a sentence long and I can't really present them because they're all different you really have to read them but uh and this is titled uh, apothegms and interludes but this is where he really starts to get sexist and of course this presents an issue not only from a moral standpoint at least in the way that I'd consider myself to be moral it, it, much to my chagrin reading Nietzsche but I think that it conflicts quite um firmly with Nietzsche's own approach here. That is, and this comes out much later in the text when he essentially says, doesn't essentially, when he says, women should remain silent, they should just be uh, subordinate to men, and so on. To which I'm thinking, well, that seems like quite a way to stifle the will to power within women by reducing women to a male standard that would only be uh, the demonstration of a sort of mediocrity, one that can be extended everywhere with this general idea about uh, the place that women serve or the role that women serve within society by saying that women have one function and therefore anything outside of that is going against their nature, which seems to me like a replication of the very logics of morality that he is trying to undo. These universalisms that try to reduce entire swaths of humanity to easily explainable and understandable entities. So this 
brief chapter, these compiled with, uh, comprised of these aphorisms, goes down that route and lays out why it is important to move beyond mediocrity into excellence or into greatness. So, yeah, I'll stop that here, ending with chapter four, and I'll pick up next time with chapter five. If there's anything I got wrong, I'd love to hear about it. Uh, I probably have annoyed a lot of you, because I know there are quite a few people who like to use Nietzsche for to justify um, some garbage opinions. And I think that there is some truth to that. I don't think that Nietzsche was necessarily a good person, because I believe very wholeheartedly, apparently, in this idea about the good, which is the great irony in criticizing Nietzsche. He has put himself beyond reproach because good and evil ultimately mean nothing. Good and bad mean nothing. And so therefore, to criticize him with that, he has already anticipated that and has can therefore evade any criticism. But in any case, this is what he gives us. I think I've been fairly accurate and have been decently hard in my criticism could be worse, and I will get more into it in the next half, because he gets worse. But in any case, I'm rambling now. Uh, like, share, subscribe if you like what I did. If you didn't dislike, leave a rambling comment. Uh, and yeah, catch you next time. Take care.